The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, last week in Bali, Indonesia, it was smiles all around between President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping. And really, it dialed down the temperature between these two countries that at once feels, you know, that there's just we're, we're hurling towards war and over Taiwan and the South China Sea and over technology and all these different contentious points between the two countries. And again, that meeting last week, I think in many ways was very important in terms of sending a message that at least there's an opportunity to communicate. But below the surface, the tensions between these two countries continue to be extraordinarily high and relations seem to be souring in so many different ways, especially when it comes to the tech space. And so we're going to talk about technology today. And in order to set up our conversation about the U.S.-China tech competition in Africa, I think it's instructive to look at what's going on out here in Asia. And I want to start with some comments by Evan Feigenbaum, who is the vice president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C., That's one of the premier think tanks in D.C. And if you're not familiar with Evan, he is one of the most well-known, most respected Asia strategists in D.C. He spent almost a decade in various senior Asia roles in the State Department. He's the co-founder of the China-focused think tank known as Macro Polo in Chicago. And he's written a number of books on U.S. policy in China and Asia. And Kobus, the point here that I'm trying to make is that this is a guy who's been around Washington for a very long time. He knows what he's talking about. And what you're going to hear from him might actually surprise you. So earlier this month, he gave the keynote address at the second annual East Asia Strategy Forum in Ottawa, Canada, that was co-hosted by the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy in the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. Now, just to be clear... He was specifically referring to U.S.-Chinese tech competition here in the Asia-Pacific region and not in Africa. But I think there are some interesting parallels that we can draw from Evan's insights on how the U.S. is approaching the competition with China for tech in Asia and what it might do in a region like Africa. So just to set up his remarks... Evan was specifically referring to how over the past two presidential administrations in the U.S., the U.S. government is leveraging now a wide range of administrative and regulatory controls to clamp down on Chinese technology both at home and abroad. And I will tell you, the United States is increasingly extraterritorializing the application of these instruments precisely because it is not the trajectory of everybody else's policy. If it was, ideally what the United States would want to see is other countries deploying export controls and administrative and regulatory instruments in an identical way vis-a-vis China as a trading partner, as a capital partner in or out, and particularly in the technology and data space. Because that's not happening, the United States is attempting to elicit voluntary compliance. And if it cannot, I confidently predict to you the United States is going to bring the hammer down going to bring the hammer down and try to coerce compliance on a lot of these controls. And it reflects this American zeitgeist on competition with China, which, by the way, is mirrored in some respects on the Chinese side. And the Chinese have built their own architecture to use administrative and regulatory instruments and are trying to offshore it in the same way. But it will catch other countries not called the United States and China betwixt and between. Now, Evan goes on to talk about U.S. rhetoric that we've heard quite a bit in Africa, from the likes of Secretary of State Antony Blinken to the State Department's top diplomat for Africa, Molly Fee, who we interviewed a couple of weeks ago on this show, that Washington doesn't want countries to have to choose between the U.S. and China. Evan says, don't believe it. We're heading for a somewhat fractious period between the United States and the very partners that it needs to navigate competition with China. So you often hear this talking point from Washington. The United States isn't forcing countries to choose. We don't, we don't want anybody to have to choose. 
Okay. Try putting Huawei kit in your 5G backbone and see how the United States feels about you not making a choice. Try not complying with U.S. export controls and see whether the United States wants you to make a choice. Try making Huawei your cybersecurity partner of choice, as Indonesia has. All those political tensions between China and Indonesia, guess who's doing cybersecurity backbone solutions in Indonesia? Huawei. How does the United States feel about that? Would prefer you don't make a choice? Those contradictions are going to get sharper and sharper. Now, the conventional Washington story is everybody needs to adjust to that because the U.S. is weighty and big and has power and has scale. But what I'm trying to tell you is that quite apart from the debate about security balancing, in the region of the region that exists rather than the one of American wishes, dreams, and think tank fantasies, and I say that as the vice president of a major Washington think tank, the United States is going to figure how to how, how to na- figure out how to have to navigate that as well. Okay, again, he was saying that in an Asian context, but I think it would be foolish, Cobus, to think that it's going to be a lot different in Africa or other global South regions. Yes, I agree. You know, one key reason for that is that as, you know, actors like Huawei have faced a lot more pressure in the global north, they've been leaning into their business with the global south. And that's not only in in relation to ICT business, but, you know, Huawei is increasingly moving into renewable energy and other sectors as well. So then it becomes a multi-platform development issue for these countries to solve, where also their trade relationship with China far outweighs their, their trade relationship frequently with the United States. So it then raises very interesting questions about where the leverage will lie. Well, let's get a perspective on the U.S.-China tech competition in Africa from one of Evan's colleagues at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C. Jane Munga is a fellow in the Africa program there where she focuses specifically on technology policy. Last month, she wrote a fascinating article with her Carnegie colleague, Kyla Denwood, that asked, how will U.S.-China tech decoupling affect Africa's mobile phone market? Jane, a very good morning to you in Washington, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Good morning, Eric, and good morning, Kobas, and thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on this podcast to discuss this very important topic. It is wonderful to have you here, and we're so excited to be able to dive into this with someone like you who's got this deep expertise Let's start with the fact that you echo many of the same points that your colleague Evan Feigenbaum made in his remarks. Just quickly, let me quote from your article just to set the stage for what we're going to talk about. You said, the tensions between the United States and China over digital technologies are growing with wide ranging implications for Africa's digital economy on issues from infrastructure and platforms to hardware devices. Before we get into the details about mobile phones, let's start our conversation at a little bit of a higher level about those tensions that you wrote about and that Evan spoke to. How are they impacting Africa? Thank you for this question. I think, as uh, even Evan said, there are so many levels and layers that we're beginning to see increasing on the impact. First, when uh, governments are engaging the different providers, the different vendors, we're beginning to see a lot of influence coming from the U.S., especially when African countries are beginning to engage with China. And why do I say this? Similarly to what Evan has brought up, we're beginning to see African governments being pulled into these diplomacy conversations to work with U.S.-based companies. If you remember some time ago, and I also quote in the article, there was the U.S.-led declaration for the future of the internet, which had far-reaching implications for countries that were coming on board to work uh, with the U.S. One of the key paragraphs that was in this was to work with trusted networks. So this is an escalation of saying that if you want to invest in telecommunications infrastructure, you need to work with trusted networks, which are already defined as those that come in from the U.S. or some of its allies. So some of the high-level implications is to show that policymakers have been influenced on what kind of vendors they can work with. And just as even I said that once you start engaging with Huawei or any other company, you find this quick rush of diplomatic meetings and introduction of uh, U.S. companies through USTDA, like through trade agencies, where they're exposing African governments to work with these different type of American companies. So the implications are coming from that high level point where there's a new direction, where where there's a recognition that Africa needs to shift and it's being shown how to shift to this type of technologies. The implications will continue when 
African countries continue, for the most time, some of them have been on the sidelines. We saw even with the declaration of the future of the internet, a lot of countries did not sign on to it. Actually, what was most interesting is my country, Kenya, initially agreed to be on this list as signatories, but soon after they issued a statement indicating that it was premature and they were not part of the signatory. So we can all un- imagine what happened in the background when that shift happened. But it's to show that there's already these implications for policymakers. The implications now, I think we can go next, is what we'll talk about is a mobile phone industry and what happens when the technology begins to be shut off due to different the tech tech decoupling that's happening globally. But these are some, I think, some of the issues that we need need to start looking and where they're driving us because they will continue to make these influences in what is happening at least at the high level policy areas. So Jane, to put this kind of pressure in context, can you give us an idea of what China's current engagement in African ICT looks like? Kind of, We've heard obviously different kind of stories about, about for example, their role in building undersea cables and the role of companies like Transian in, in selling cheap mobile phones. But like if you were to give a kind of a, a beginner to the field, a kind of a thumbnail, you know, kind of portrait of what China's ICT engagement looks like in Africa at the moment, like how would you answer that? China's engagement in Africa in the ICT sector is in different levels, and it begins at the very infrastructure. The last 10 or 15 years, Africa has been going through a digital transformation. Most countries need to lay the basic infrastructure through the fiber optic backbones, through towers, for example, with the mobile companies. So a lot of uh, the investments that we've seen that have happened in the private sector and even through the governments, we've seen a lot of infrastructure that has been laid by Chinese companies backed by their loan, the Exim Bank loans. Then now let's now move that more to usability by the citizen or by the common person. We find that the devices that uh, most Africans are engaging on are made through Chinese companies or companies that have been incorporated in China. The statistics show it's over 70% of Africans engaged in mobile companies. Now a big chunk of that, almost 40% is going to Chinese companies. This is where it becomes interesting. A lot of Africans' applications where they engage is still mostly driven by U.S. companies, the popular ones, Facebook, Google, Gmail, YouTube, and so forth. So that's where we see the deviation that a lot of uh, Africans are still engaging on American or Western-based applications, but the infrastructure in which uh, they are engaging in is driven uh, by Chinese companies. Also, talking about the media, a lot of the media companies also have had, uh, especially when digital migration happened about uh, 10 years or so ago, a lot of uh, the digital migration technologies and infrastructure that helped countries migrate was also done by Chinese companies. And then also hence came in some of the companies that were also helping put the set of boxes to help now the TVs also transmit through the new protocols that was put by ITU. So we are seeing multiple levels of Chinese integration in the everyday use and also within the infrastructure that is being laid by companies and even the applications. There was a great chart that came out a couple of years ago that showed the East African mobile technology stack. And that is every layer of the technology that's used to facilitate a phone call. And Chinese technology permeated all of it, from the undersea cable to the network to the equipment to the device. The only thing I'll take issue with you is that it used to be true that it was American apps and American services that dominated. But let's not forget that TikTok is a Chinese service. And TikTok is eating the world up right now in terms of time consumed. Let's also not forget that Boomplay, the number one music service in Africa, is also a Chinese service. So that space that Americans and Europeans have dominated on the content space now seems to be also contested by the Chinese as well in Africa. So just th- that's getting much more complicated. Let's talk about the devices. That was the focus of your piece. The company that everybody needs to know about and so few people outside of Africa actually know about is a company called Transin, which is based in Shenzhen, China. They saw an opportunity in Africa to build phones that were specifically tailored for African consumers. That is, the artificial intelligence used to take pictures was customized for darker complexions. They made it dustproof. They made longer batteries. They created a whole app layer that was specifically tailored for African consumers. Today, I think the valuation for Transin is somewhere around $7 billion, mostly coming from Africa. So they prove not only that there's a huge market in Africa for devices if you build them for the customers, but that it's possible to reach scale across the continent. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about the importance specifically of transin and why in your research it's done so much to be so successful? Thanks, Eric. And going back to your earlier comment, I do agree that we are beginning to see TikTok and really taking over the app application. It is there, but there are still those other traditional, like the YouTubes and, and so forth. So it's true, these things are beginning to shift. But then coming on to Transion, Transion also has been one of the most favorable, besides what you have just uh, explained, is the cost. It is an extremely affordable phone. It is accessible. Um, it, and the vendorship in the continent is reaching even to the very village level. So the Technophone, which is the most popular phone made by Transion, is something that every household seems to have because they can afford it. And also it has a long life battery that you can also use it. And sometimes they also give you these extra solar panels to charge with it. So it tries and look at the entire ecosystem of what it means for an African to have that phone. Techno also has not seen some of the limitations that are on the Huawei phone, although some of the newer versions, there are some of those limitations. But for the most part, those with a Techno, I say that because I also know when I wrote this article, I have a brother who lives in Kenya and he mentioned to me, oh, so that's what's been happening to my Techno phone. Um, some of the limitations that he's beginning to see happening on his phone. So Wait, I'm sorry, can I just stop you there? What are you referring to? You're talking about the problems with Google that Huawei's having? Yeah, some of the applications. But I don't think that's crossed over to to Transin yet. I mean, because Transin hasn't been put on the entities list. It, it hasn't, but there are some applications that are becoming harder and harder to update and to use within the African continent. And you think that's because of U.S. pressure? I think these are some of the things that we're beginning to believe that are coming from that kind of tech decoupling. And once you try and, and upload some of these apps, you, you seem to run into more complications. You have to jump these hoops to get some of these updates that are there. But also some of these could just be complications of some of these applications are not readily available in Kenya. There are so many variations of YouTube that you will not find in the African continent because those services are just not offered. So there could be multiple issues that are happening here. But what Transion for sure has done, it has been able to reach because of affordability is a big factor. If you can get a smartphone at uh, 10000 that's about $100, as compared to either the Samsung, which does very well in Africa, at $500, or even Apple, which can go even higher than that. I mean, both of them seem to compete on the pricing. Then you, you get a bigger demographic with a cheaper smartphone, which is also now tailored um, for you. Now, if we continue to see decoupling happening, in all platforms, which there are signs that we, are, we may see a movement beyond just Huawei phones, then we do imagine that there will be greater implications for these Africans who are on these techno phones. Kobus, over the years, we have been following African policymakers' reaction to this tension between the United States and China over tech. And there was a famous comment by your president, Cyril Ramaphosa, who said that the United States was jealous of China and its technology innovations. Also, the former ICT minister, the communications minister of Kenya, Joseph Mucheru, he too was very clear saying that the United States will not dictate to African governments and to the Kenyan government about what companies it uses in its networks and what companies it doesn't. So, Kobus, it does seem like there's a lot of pushback to a lot of what Jane's been talking about in terms of Africa getting stuck in the middle of this increasingly contentious battle between the two powers. Yes, because of kind of consistent critical attitudes towards Western power, you know, among many African publics, and South Africa is a key one, the optics of being pressured by the US has immediate kind of political kind of ramifications within the continent. So kind of like standing up to the US as bullying, you know, kind of becomes a kind of a popular talking point, you know, kind of by African politicians. So that's one of the reasons why I think this is going to be very interesting to see how all of this shakes out, among others, because... You know, kind of as we've seen, you know, in, in other fights too, it's U.S. companies have their own agendas. You know, so, so it's, it's harder. It's harder for the U.S. government to dictate to them unless they dictate to them in a very kind of heavy-handed way, as increasingly seeing with China. But that, of course, has its own kind of political and economic implications. Jane, in relation to the specific issue around apps, I was wondering how you see, particularly Huawei, kind of adapting to this U.S. pressure. Because one of the surprises that we found has been that when Huawei lost its access to the Google Play Store and therefore couldn't have kind of Google apps, um, everyone expected their business to, to crater. And it certainly kind of 
declined a lot. What we've seen in South Africa is that it actually is that Huawei phones continue to be relatively popular, even without those apps. So I was wondering kind of like what you made of that and what that kind of says about the wider kind of decoupling conversation. Thank you for that. The Huawei phones, it's true, have continued to become also quite popular. First, I think the marketing strategy of Huawei is genius. They continue to have availability of their phones and the latest phones. And a lot of shops, at least I know in Kenya, you can walk in into a genuine Huawei shop, which offers you all the variety of services that you cannot get, for example, in an Apple shop, because you would you just, there's no Apple shop in Kenya. So what that means is people are still exposed to the phone. So it still becomes a high-tech phone that you're able to operate with. And then you just have to adapt to the different applications that are offered in it. I have seen of late that there are some apps that are able to get you around to where you can get the Google Play Store. It doesn't come in it, but I think people are being a bit more creative and finding ways around to download this. But it also shows that the demand for quality phones that are achievable and accessible to Africans is still very high. So maybe we're reaching that threshold that shows us that it's not about some of these applications that we see, but it's having that device that you can still continue to interact with. And maybe the human culture is you're able to then change what kind of interaction that you have or find ways of trying to stay on onto the apps that you really want to engage with. So these are some of the interesting trends that we're beginning to see. And I think this is continuously going to be shaped by what, but how vendors are able to also reach the African market. And I think it's also very important to note that one of the things that uh, we're also beginning to see um, is a change of strategy is that even the U.S. government now is coming with their vendors when they have these meetings with governments in Africa. This is traditionally not something that we've seen. That was very traditional for the China uh, model of doing things. But we're beginning to see where the U.S. government through its trade agencies and other agencies is introducing uh, the Apple and, and Microsoft, so they come as a package. For me, formerly coming from the government, was interesting to see that shift because this is something that we, we, we never traditionally saw coming from the US. So it's a recognition that America is shifting how it's engaging and it's beginning to push for its companies up front as opposed to the tradition. Yeah, one area that we're seeing that competition play out is in the data center space where Microsoft and Google and a number of other American companies are competing aggressively with Chinese companies for data centers. So we can talk about data centers, but I also want to talk about this issue that you've raised in terms of the United States government now trying to raise its game to compete with the Chinese. Are you familiar with a company by the name of Afrasel? No, I'm not. So Afracel is a company that is backed by the Development Finance Corporation. It got a $100 million startup loan by the USDFC, and it's now competing in Angola and also in the DRC. The problem is, is that it can't compete at the same scale. So they are providing network services, and the idea is that they are free of Huawei technology. So this is the showcase for the Americans to say, we can build telephone networks and telecom networks in Africa without Huawei. The problem is, is that They're so small. And this speaks to the challenge facing a number of African governments that the fact is, is that Huawei is the indispensable tech company in most African countries at every level of the tech stack. So if they were presented with the choice, as your colleague Evan kind of said, you're either with us or you're against us, or the United States is going to try and be more coercive in terms of persuading countries and companies to not use Chinese tech. Huawei, ZTE, Hikvision, any of those. The fact is that if they came down to it, they might have to choose the Chinese side because they're too deep into it already. What choices do African countries have when it comes to navigating this very contentious political dispute? Thanks, Eric, and also for bringing that up on Afrasel. I'll look up on that. In the article that I wrote, I fell short of putting the implications for the various governments and markets and so forth because there are just so many implications and they could go either way. If a country has to come to the point where it has to choose, then I think naturally you're already in deeply invested in one technology. It's very expensive technology. You can't overnight change it. I think naturally you'll have to make the natural selection that you may have to use what you already have in your country. What, however, is the implications of this growing decoupling and pressures that are seen in African countries is that if African countries truly want also to shake off these pressures, there is the opportunities like Africa. Where you can start building 
from within and building your own capacities, building your own networks, building your own funds. But also this take time. They take a lot of technology, they take a lot of financing and look at just the production chain of making, let's even just talk about a simple phone. This takes a lot of the propriety rights and also getting all the different components that to go and not even to forget the semiconductors issue that is already going geopolitically. So there are opportunities where Africans can grow from within their own systems, their own funds. But I think then it will have to take very targeted and strategic interventions from governments, not just from a national level, but even a transatlantic level, where they come together and start saying, if AfriCell is the model as a continent that we want to do, then how can we work with our partners? For example, if it's the U.S. government that is already supporting this, this is something that can be easier to absorb within African countries because then it's something that is, will be seen that is coming from within and it's not just really being in post. But again, it takes strategic engagement it also takes something that we don't see a lot, African countries coming together and having one voice and one common agenda on this issue, which is something we also have not yet seen coming strongly. But it's a very interesting question. And I think answering it fully is something time will tell. If a country has to choose what way will you go, uh, depending on your own specific capacities. For example, I said I come from Kenya. Kenya has already has one of the biggest uh, telco companies in Africa, Safaricom, which is heavily invested in Chinese companies. Over 40 million people are running on that platform. So you can't just shut down Safaricom without an alternative. A country even looking at its own uh, security and its own economy, it's hard to choose not to use what you already invested in. So, of course, the natural choices, we can only say what, how they will make them. How concerned are you that countries' development choices and their own development agendas will start falling under pressure from, for example, the United States or competitive pressure from the United States and China? So, so in a lot, of, a lot of countries now, we see you know, logistic corridors being planned, or we see, you know, like the integration of, of ICT technology into larger development um, initiatives, you know, in, including all kinds of like smart city and e-government projects and so on. So obviously those are kind of like multi-platform, multi-level development plans in which ICT plays a very big role. But, you know, kind of and, and, and kind of changing out the ICT that that's already been added or the kind of changing the partnerships that, that, that have already been built up will then delay and change the entire development plan. So kind of how concerned are you that African countries are going to start falling under this kind of pressure? Kobas, I think uh, the answer is African countries are already falling under that pressure. Um, there are a lot of uh, development plans and a lot of uh, policies that are coming on the ICT sector from African countries uh, are being subjected to discussion um, by diplomats and by the U.S. government in, in various levels. Um, and one way of doing that, one way of, of, of even examples of this is when I look at ICT technologies and some of the, the interventions that are happening even with the Kenyan government, like e-government, like you've mentioned, a lot of these are being fronted by U.S. companies. They are, they, are, they are coming as consortiums. So whereby if you want to uh, implement the strategy and the policy that you have, similarly to what China has been doing, a U.S. consortium is coming and offering you all the various solutions uh, that you need within your country. So that pressure is already coming and then it's also coming with funding. So I think countries are now being given the opportunity to choose, uh, but then it's still not a choice. It's, it's, it's that if you want our funding, then this is how you're supposed to implement this. So we're already beginning to see that kind of pressure coming in on the implementation of the policies and strategies and also on the feedback that is coming on some of the policies that uh, are being implemented within the countries themselves. Now, there may be rhetoric, but the fact is that the United States up until now, as far as I can see, has been wholly ineffective in persuading African countries to actually make any substantive changes. You brought up the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, which in many ways typifies what the United States been, has been doing in this space, where they had three countries that signed up for it out of 54, and then it went down to two countries because your own country said, uh, no, we're not part of this. Do you remember the Clean Network? Mm -hmm. This was one of the Trump administration's initiatives to go around the world and to persuade companies and countries to abandon using Huawei. Not a single African country signed on to this. And at the same time, Huawei's inroads in Africa and ZTE's inroads in Africa 
and Chinese tech companies writ large continue to to really grow and grow and grow. Let's not forget that you talked about Safaricom. M-Pesa, which is the mobile money service of Safaricom, is powered by Huawei Mobile Money. Telibur in Ethiopia, powered by Huawei Mobile Money. We can go through the list of things that Huawei is doing. The United States simply doesn't have an answer to any of this stuff. So when their diplomats sit down with the Kenyan ICT you know, folks, they, they don't have a, a, an answer for Huawei Mobile Money. Do you know what I mean? So I'm wondering, what's the substance of it behind the U.S. offer when they try to persuade a government like Kenya to say, back away from the Chinese? I think, Eric, you've hit the nail on the head. There is not one. There's not a viable one. But they have this ideology that it is possible to have one. <laughs> well, that's called wishful thinking, by the way. That is called wishful <laughs> thinking. <laughs> I think there's a lot of that happening. And that's why we have not begun to see the U.S. government and its companies really take over as they wish they would. And there's a lot of room for U.S. companies if they really do want to make inroads. Then they also have to put, I mean, put your money on the table, put your solution on the table. If you want your devices then to be used in your applications, who can afford an iPhone? I mean, what's the percentage of Africans who can afford an iPhone? And Apple doesn't want those customers, by the way. Apple is a premium product. Exactly. It's a luxury product. It does not want, you know, sub $100 market. That's just not Apple's market. I think, Eric, you say things a bit more boldly than I would say that, but that's, <laughs> that's the reality. And that's the truth. And nobody will raise this. When you bring these issues to the U.S. policymakers, they don't have solutions for you. Today, as we speak, and I sat in so many meetings in my past life where we would speak very frankly to U.S. companies and tell them, if you want your services in this country, as basic as possible, set up an office. How do people, as I said earlier, Huawei has companies, vendors, and Huawei itself is already located in Kenya. You do not find an Apple office in Kenya. It doesn't even exist. And this happens for so many U.S. products. And you're right, they are not making it for the African market. So I think there needs to be a change or maybe the, the U.S. government needs to have a reality check with its own companies and say, this is our strategy. We would want to enter this market. How can we work together? I think that that is a conversation that I am yet to see happen in DC. It's something that even as we engage in DC on the tech sector, is something that most people don't want to speak about. What I have seen a lot is a lot of the digital governance uh, and democracy conversations uh, that you're, you need to work with the trusted networks and values, but there's no actual practicality of exactly what that means. Besides now this push for working with, the, especially in the US strategy for Af uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, we started seeing a push for new initiatives and new investments in Africa. Maybe that is going to start being shaped now, but I think the solutions, Eric, I agree with you 100%. They are not on the table and they do not exist as we speak. And uh, when you speak in DC to American stakeholders and you, uh, you, know, and you point that out, what kind of reactions do you get? Are there plans to start anything or you know, kind of, is it more of a situation of, yes, yes, we definitely need to think about that? I am yet to speak maybe to policymakers who have an answer to that. I think there's very high level thinking of where the U.S. wants to go on U.S. tech decoupling and its influence in Africa. And I don't think that has yet translated to practical solutions. So for policymakers, they are very clear on direction, which is good. I come from policy, so it's always good to have your strategic vision. But then breaking that down to what it's actually going to mean, I think that's a conversation maybe that is going to happen now, maybe even on the sidelines of the Africa Leadership Summit that we're going to see. But that is something that personally I've not seen that coming from policymakers in D.C. You know, they've been talking about getting more American companies to invest in Africa for as long as I can remember, and American companies just don't seem to be interested. I mean, most of them, for the, and tech companies specifically. So it's, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical. Jane, thank you so much for your time and your insights on this absolutely fascinating issue. The article is, how will US-China tech decoupling affect Africa's mobile phone market? But as you can see, this touches on any number of issues in the broader tech sector. Jane Munga is a Africa fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, DC. She faces a very difficult task 
trying to persuade American stakeholders about what's going on in Africa and in specifically in Kenya in the tech sector. Jane, thank you so much for joining us. If people want to follow what you're reading and writing, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? They can uh, follow us at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. There's an Africa program that is there. There's also myself on uh, Twitter, uh, Jay Munga, and I'm also on LinkedIn at Jane Munga. Wonderful. I'll put a link to Jane's Twitter handle, her LinkedIn handle, and also the article in the show notes. Jane Munga, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Kobus, I know that there's a need and even a demand to frame this as some kind of competition between the U.S. and China. But at the end of the day, I come away with the same level of skepticism that I've always had about the U.S. efforts to confront Huawei, that unless you've got a product or a financing package or some kind of solution that answers the fundamental question that a company like Safaricom would ask to say, okay, you want me to take Huawei out of my rack and out of my network? then what are you going to do for me? Are you going to provide me with, A, the money to replace the Huawei equipment, the costs that have already sunk into the network, and B, are you going to then provide me with low-cost financing to buy Samsung or Ericsson or Alcatel or any of the so-called clean brands of technology? And the United States comes up short all the time. So what they end up doing is, as Evan suggested in his comments at the beginning of the show, is they're going to become increasingly contentious to say, don't use Chinese tech. But they're not going to come through with the second part of that discussion, which is, well, then what do we do? And if you don't have that second question, there's no competition. At the end of the day, China's going to win this one. Yeah, because the narrative makes itself, right? And we, we're already seeing Chinese diplomats kind of using the same narrative in relation to the superconductor ban. And I've, I've heard a, a Chinese diplomat saying that to me, was that, yeah, the US was happy to have us destroy our environment and, you know, kind of um, to do low-cost manufacturing, but the moment we want to move up the value chain, they, they shut us down. You know, and of course, you know, that's a very, very selective view of, of how the superconductor thing kind of shook out. But that is the narrative. That is the narrative that they that they are pushing at the moment, and that is definitely going to be the narrative they're pushing in Africa. So it's like, yeah, you know, kind of the United States is trying to to, keep, to hold us down, and they're trying to hold you down too. And that's going to be a tough narrative to fight, you know, kind of because in order to fight it, you have to put money on the table, and frequently there isn't money to put on the table. Yeah, that's just not the American way of doing it. And again, initiatives like Africel, I think, get a lot of attention. But the problem is, is the scale. If you're not operating at the scale that Huawei, ZTE, Hikvision, any of these Chinese companies are operating at, then you're really not competing. So yes, you're making a very small dent. But in many ways, it's just tapping on the toenail of the dragon. Okay, I mean, you're really not actually going to change the equation or the fundamental dynamics of tech in Africa. Interesting to your point about what that Chinese diplomat told you about the Americans are coming for us today and then tomorrow they're going to come for you. That is exactly what they're saying to folks out here in Southeast Asia and what they've been telling Indians. You see it in the propaganda on Twitter and you see this all the time saying we're the first, but they're coming for you next. I think there is a lot of appeal to that sentiment in many parts of the developing world. So U.S. policymakers need to tread very, very carefully if they don't want to get sucked into that rhetorical trap, because I think there is, there's an ample reservoir of skepticism towards the United States and this perception of, you know, telling other countries what to do. And the problem is, though, is that as the U.S.-China relationship becomes more contentious, and let's again go back to what Evan Feigenbaum was saying, that the United States is going to switch from voluntary cooperation to more coercive measures, that too is probably going to generate some kind of backlash in places like South Africa and Kenya. I think beyond backlash, it may also, because because the U.S. can't really kind of step up to do a kind of one-to-one -one replacement, like we've seen them do with some of their other allies, like their richer allies, because there's not really a willingness or political will to mobilize the amount of resources, you know, to do it, what it will end up doing is just moving Africa towards China. And, you know, because the logic then is that it's like ch Chinese technology or nothing, you know, and no one in Africa, particularly, you know, it's the world's youngest population, it's the only last real kind of emerging market for tech left in the world, you know, so there's no discussion there, right? Kind of like the, the, the moment that they try and kind of use any of these kind of coercive tactics, they essentially lose the entire continent. What that will look like 
is the other question. You know, kind of like what those kind of tactics will be and what the kind of impact will be on African economies and what that kind of like that pull away will look like is all of those are going to be a lot messier than I think one one would imagine. One very important point of clarification that I want to make, I don't want to give the impression that companies like Safaricom in Kenya or Vodacom in South Africa or MTN in South Africa are only using Huawei. The fact is, is that in their 4G and their 5G networks, what they've said repeatedly is that they use a mix of brands in their networking. So they don't want to be reliant on any one provider. That is just not a good way of doing it. And by the way, that is best practice around the world for major telecoms. The issue comes when we look at Botswana, Malawi, these smaller telecom operators that oftentimes Huawei will come with a turnkey solution. Well, we'll build your entire network from soup to nuts. And again, I don't know the specifics of it, which countries are doing that, but what we've known is the fact that the package of Chinese technology, which is oftentimes better than the competitors in many cases, at a lower price. And on top of that, it comes with this financing from the China Exim Bank. That is a package that has proven to be incredibly formidable, not just in Africa, but around the world. And that the United States and Europe, Japan and South Korea have not been able to come up with a answer that is as compelling. From time to time, by the way, the South Koreans are out there providing some development financing to promote Samsung. So they do it, but they don't do it with the same level of enthusiasm that the Chinese seem to do it or with the same level of organization that the Chinese seem to be doing it. There's something about the Chinese offer where they bring together Exim Bank with Huawei, with the embassy, with the Ministry of Commerce. They fly them over to Beijing, wine and dine them, show them all the great stuff and be able to sign on the dotted line. The Chinese just do that exceptionally well, which means that any rival to that is going to really have to up their game. Yeah, you know, and that then frequently leaves kind of actors like the United States only to become more and more strident, you know, kind of or, or more or trying to be more coercive, which I really hope won't be the case because that will, I think, end up badly for everyone, particularly for Africa. You know, the thing is, in the end, like kind of African development priorities have to come first. Like, sorry, but like, it's that it's their lives, you know, kind of so so they make that they make that decision, and so the people who work best with Africa are people who could. To, to kind of keep that in mind and find ways of working their own agenda into that larger agenda. China has been quite good at it and it also has developed an entire set of rhetorical tools to, you know, kind of to position itself at the center of that conversation, particularly now in relation, like through something like the Global Development Initiative. So that, you know, kind of really taking development seriously, like, you know, and, and really knowing what that means to have to develop, you know, that itself is an entire set of skills and knowledges that China has a lot more recent experience in than many, many of you of, of the, the kind of Western competitors. And that I think remains a, a significant issue, the very issue of development itself, you know, the weight of development itself is not 100% kind of taken seriously. Kobus, you bring up an excellent point regarding the development narrative. And one of the themes of our show over the past, say, 12 to 18 months has been this precipitous decline that really traces back to 2017, but really gained momentum during the pandemic for large scale infrastructure development financing coming from China. Looks like the Chinese, for the most part, are backing out of building railroads and multi-billion dollar projects in Africa. Those days are gone. They've been over for quite some time, but now I think it's starting to really settle in. That said, the new focus, and this was outlined at last year's Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Conference in Senegal, is going to be on digital. We hear a lot about the digital Silk Road, the digital BRI, all these different things. So I think in many respects, you're going to continue to see a push of Chinese tech in Africa. That's not going to be the place where they pull back, in part because the risks of investing in technology are much lower than the risks of building a road. So the day that the Huawei data center in Senegal turned on, revenue was coming in the door. Fees were being generated on day one. And mobile networks generate revenue almost immediately as well. So the ROI on some of these digital projects is much better than on other infrastructure. It'll be interesting to see how tech is then folded into the evolution of the BRI, which appears to be this thing that you mentioned called the Global 
Development Initiative. And by the way, Xi Jinping made a big splash about the GDI at his speech at the G20 last week in Bali as well. Did not mention, not once did he mention the Belt and Road in his speech. I thought that was very interesting as well. So I guess the question that I have for you is thinking about continued tech investment by the Chinese in Africa. And then do you see tech playing a role in GDI or will that stay as part of BRI? I think GDI is essentially BRI 2.0, kind of moving it past a preoccupation with large-scale hard infrastructure, which you know, the, the, you know, is it was obviously very important for the BRI, but there was also c- certain limits, and one one of the limits is the amount of credit that these that these countries can absorb. But you know, but but with that is. The, the BRI was all about connectivities. It was, I think, the five connectivities. And technological connectivity was one of them. And I think that obsession with connectivity, which brings with it policy integration, it brings with it kind of much, much closer coordination between governments, and now also much, much closer and seamless kind of indivisible cooperation on development, and with it, the, the kind of setting up of, of shared ideas of what development is and what development looks like, with China at the center, being the big intellectual driver of what development is going to look like in the 21st century, there seems to be a lot of a lot of potential there for, for cooperation with Africa. So, you know, so and I, th- I think digital is going to be right at the center. So when we talk about tech and digital things, a lot of people think about the things that they can see, which are telephones or apps and things like that. But again, I really want to direct people to what they're not seeing. So Huawei mobile money, Huawei solar power solutions, now we have the peace cable that has made landfall in Kenya. And the peace cable is, help me with this acronym, Kobus, Pakistan. It's Pakistan, East Africa, connecting to Europe. Okay, Pakistan, East Africa, connecting to Europe, because it drops also in Marseille. And it also connects to South Africa, yes. And it connects, eventually it'll connect to South Africa. I don't think it's there quite yet. Then we also have the Beidou navigation system, which is the alternative to the Galileo system from the Europeans or the GPS system from the Americans. That has more satellites over Africa than the GPS or Galileo does. So we can see a day at some point when we're going to have a lot more use of Beidou than GPS. Then there is the e-commerce solution. So, for example, at Addis Ababa's Bole International Airport, Tsai which is the logistics arm of Alibaba, has set up a huge distribution hub and is part of the air bridge connecting the southern Chinese province of Changsha with Addis Ababa. And there's going to be a facilitation of e-commerce goods coming into Africa from China. So it's happening. All of this is behind the scenes. So this is, again, why I kind of think that it's a little bit of a, I want to say a joke. It's a little bit laughable. It's kind of cute that the Americans think there's a competition because I don't see any comparable you know, effort by the Americans. Yes, Google and Facebook and YouTube are hugely popular, but Twitter just closed its African office. Facebook has never been serious about Africa. And I just don't see the same passion for expanding their tech presence in Africa that the Chinese are doing. So final thoughts to you on this. I think a key factor here is who is willing to make the conceptual leap into seeing not only Africa as a potential market, but Africa as an already existing market and where one can actually make money. And in those terms, on the, in the tech sector, China has already made that leap. You know, they have entire narratives set up, right? Kind of the idea of like, you just like Shenzhen was in, 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 19, in the 70s, you know, like ready for development. It's all kind of like like rainbows from here, you know, that that kind of narrative and that kind of like jump into kind of conceptualizing that kind of African prosperity and Africa as as a viable market, that's just not an imaginative leap that I, I see people in Silicon Valley making. When there is engagement from the US tech sector in Africa, it tends to be more along the lines of kind of aid projects or development projects, right? Kind of which are which are absolutely no, you know, kind of no not dissing them, but you know, kind of but but it doesn't have that kind of futuristic kind of aspect that China's kind of tech engagement in Africa has. And you know, the thing is what one is also now seeing you know, the, the Chinese have been in, in Africa long enough that we can now actually see that in a lot of cases, you know, kind of what end up being fueled is African 
solutions to or African interventions in African problems, right? Kind of so, and micropayments being the classic example. You know, Africans need to give little bits of money to lots of different people. Most of those people don't have banks, so there's no way of they don't have bank accounts, which means it's very difficult to send them money. If you don't have them cash, there's you know kind of making that leap where you can make a little payment off your phone. You know, that is an African solution to a particular kind of African problem. And it ended up kind of creating African companies doing that and creating a lot of jobs. And the fact that a lot of them are happening on the back of Chinese technology backbones, like reveals a a, a buy-in from China at a stage when these things didn't exist yet. Now they exist. But we still not seeing any buy-in from from the US, you know. So so even with kind of like like road tested kind of like successes in Africa, you're still not seeing like any kind of like real discourse in the US around like oh we're missing the train in Africa like this. There's, there's a lot of money to be made. That's still not really happening, right? There you go. Okay. Well, let's leave the conversation there. This is obviously a fascinating topic that has so many different aspects to it. If you're interested in what is going on in this space between the U.S., the Chinese, and Africans, you're going to want to check out our site, chinaglobalsouth.com. We've got a whole tech section devoted to these topics. We've got a tab just for Huawei as well. We go deep on it. Basically, any news that comes up in this space, we are covering with analysis, with podcasts, with transcripts, and all of that. To get access to that, all you need is a very, very low-cost subscription to the China Global South Project. By the way, we're going to be increasing our rates just a smidge in January, so we encourage you to sign up today. Only $7 a month for students and teachers, $15 a month for everybody else, and you'll get the China Global South Daily Brief that Cobus and I and the team put out every single day. Day. So once again, chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. So that'll do it for our discussion. We'll be back again next week with another episode of the China in Africa podcast. For Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at chinaglobalsouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afrikchine on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic.